What does this look like to everyone? It looks, yes. And in fact, when I left my apartment about 10 minutes ago or 15 minutes ago, the guys at the door said, cookies, cookies. <laughs> but no, you're wrong. It's something else. Alors, oh non. We're going to show you some sound in theater. Yeah. Well, it's thunder, right? OK, that's how we're starting. I'm sorry. <laughs> It was a big deal in the 19th century. OK. Uh, so good afternoon. And uh, thanks for being here to continue our conversation on the sense of sound. I'm Judy Miller from the Department of French Language, Literatures, and Cultures. And I'm going to moderate this panel. Uh, it's entitled Staging Sound and Silence. With me are my colleague, Benoit Bolduc, um, and the director and sound artist, Ronan Ozé. Uh, Benoit is currently the director of New York University in France, and uh, where he has actually miraculously found time to continue his research uh, on festival books and on early modern spectacle, bringing out last year a really wonderful, wonderful study called La Fête Imprimée, Cérémonie et spectacle politique, 1549 à 1662, with uh, Classic Garnier. And Roland is a percussionist, composer, and theater director. Among his recent projects is a staging of Bernard Marie Coltes's Dans la solitude des champs de coton, which has been touring in French in France, and which just opened last night in English in the solitude of the cotton fields at NYU's Skirball Center. And if you didn't have a chance to see it last night, uh, it will be performed again on Sunday at 3 o'clock. So our, our panel structure is a little unusual in terms of what we've seen so far, um, maybe in keeping with who we are, a little unusual. So um, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so this is how we're going to do this. I will situate tentatively, briefly, and admittedly sketchily uh, the question of sound in French theater. Uh, Benoit will speak about absolutism and the silent art of French opera, a talk that will take us to the intersection of art and politics, and especially to the question of archives. And Roland will discuss how he thinks about silence and sound and how this conceptualization has helped him imagine how to give shape to Cortez's enigmatic work. I'll ask Roland a few questions about the production, about his work in general, and then we'll open the floor to you all. OK? OK. So um, here's my little bit. And uh, I, I really feel uh, uh, that I've kind of glad to, I mean, I'm definitely very glad to be here, but I feel a little bit um, inauthentic, let's say, because I'm not a specialist of sound in theater, but I'm going to say a few things as though I were, so forgive me. <laughs> um, indeed, I think I'm, I'm really one of those Jenny-come-latelys who has spent her life uh, mostly in the French theater thinking about, what have I thought about? Actors and characters, sonography, and thus images, spatial messages, images again, choreography and kinesthesia, so audience and actor connections. But I've often taken for granted the sound, including the music. And of course, I'm not talking about theater, which is uh, specifically musical, uh, for musical theater of any kind. As you know, in that kind of theater, the music centers the work, and it has a life well beyond the theatrical experience. Rather, I'm talking about text-based theater, uh, which is these days a really old-fashioned notion since we've moved into the post-dramatic, but that's the theater that I've mostly worked on, in which other elements of drama complement and help make meaning from or with the words. But it's still the kinds of words that we think about when we think about the first element of this, of this kind of theater. Um, yet. I am not completely ignorant 
of a kind of sound revolution in theater. Um, and it's making its way slowly, but surely, onto the French stage. Uh, indeed, I have participated in the Coltes experiment that I hope many of you have seen or will see. Uh, and I can think of various important personal experiences in the theater in which the use of sound or music proved to be both very compelling and crucial to what the event was trying to do, trying to say. I'm going to give you a few examples of these. Um, for example, in the 80s, uh, I saw a spate of French productions that used American rock to punch up the energy, which American rock does, as well as to cover scene changes, which music is often useful for. Uh, and also in the case of a production of Sartre's Huit Clos, uh, No Exit, to speak about hell, uh, American rock being somehow the equivalent of hell. Um, <laughs> I've also uh, admired the improvised live scores of Jean-Jacques Lemaitre for the Théâtre du Soleil, uh, which signal specific characters. So there are, much like opera in that sense, or some operas in any case, there's a sound that's associated with specific characters that function also melodramatically to ballast emotion. Uh, and also, because we're always worried about this in theater, create to create fluid scene changes. And I've been riveted, riveted I've almost literally, uh, to my seat by five minutes of ear-splitting percussion before a performance of Heiner Miller's Hamlet Machine. And I've also been warned during a recent production of Joel P uh, Pomeray's Ça Ira, so it's a production based on the French Revolution, not to worry about the rifle shots and the cannon blasts coming from off stage. Uh, this was because I went to see it on November 15th, 2015, that is to say two days after what happened in Paris, um, when people were jumping out of their skin when a car backfired. So in that sense, the sound on stage was replicating in an eerie and an awful way the sound that was in everybody's th thoughts at that time. But obviously more appropriately, I think, for the concerns that we've had today, the things we've been talking about from yesterday, um, it was an evening I spent in the crypt of the Clooney Museum in 1971, um, in which, lying prone on the ground and in the dark, we, the audience, received the pinging and piercing sounds and light points that Yanis Zanakis projected from all corners of the space. That was, of course, and for the French, right, we're talking about the 70s, an early experiment in total immersion in sound. Uh, and so much, so, 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 so like, and like so much of the theater work of the 1970s, it felt like a ritual, like a ritualized spiritual awakening, rather than like an intellectual or a sensory interrogation. So, I mean, that's how I lived that in the early 70s. Um, from the growing French scholarship on sound in theater, and it is growing, but it's been late to come, uh, one can learn quite a lot not only about how sound, and when I say sound, I include in this music, voice, and silence. And I've seen from and heard from many of you how these categories can be queried, but for the moment, let's put all those together in sound, right? So I've seen how sound can be used in French theater and what historians have been able to sort of concoct from it. Um, and one can also learn about the kind of caution we must take when attempting to establish any kind of history of sound in the theatrical arts. This is a caution we've also been aware of since yesterday. Warnings that include um, not only are there few records, but we're not in very good shape to know what the sound would have actually been like. And it's not just what we hear, but it's, it's our way of listening that have probably changed. Furthermore, what machinist and Bruiteur, which was the name for noisemakers, right, or sound uh, effects technicians, actually did before the 20th century, is barely known to us. I mean, we know about the thunder sheets, right, and we know about the wind machines because they still exist in almost all the operas. And and uh, Roland was talking to me about that earlier, but um, we don't know much more than that. And we also, and I think that this has been something that's been haunting this uh, colloquium. We don't have a particularly good vocabulary 
to speak about sound in theater. Since most of our expressive vocabulary is visual, uh, as someone said yesterday, the word for the person who receives the experience of sound, right, in the theater, is a spectateur, right, and not an auditeur. Huh? So um, I've learned much of what I've just said and sketched out from reading the excellent series of articles um, in Marie-Madeleine Mervan Roux and Jean-Marc Larue's 2016 CNRS volume called Le Son au Théâtre. And I, I really want to credit them here because as I say, I, this is stuff I'm learning. Um, these articles have also helped me think about how sound has variously mattered in French theater. Uh, for example, in thinking about, and Benoit might correct me on this, but in thinking about theater until the mid or even late 18th century, we usually have to take into consideration the fact that there would have been some audience members on stage chatting during the performance. So how do we think about that sound, right? Uh, or that in the late 18th century throughout the 19th century, huge advances in sonography meant building complex mimetic sex, set, I guess just sex, <laughs> sets. <laughs> um, I don't think I have sex on my mind, but you never know, right? Okay. <laughs> so, so uh, um, oh, please, can you cut that from, can you cut that? Okay, so, com don't, so we're building com complex mimetic sets, especially of a grandiose nature, uh, uh, that included astonishing sound effects, uh, noises, especially thunder, which we tried to demonstrate, but that's a really paltry, a cookie sheet does paltry thunder, but if you have very thin sheet of tin, you can make great thunder, right? Um, and at the time, it would appear from everything that I've read, this seemed wondrous to people who went to the theater. They were astonished by it. Now today, it seems just plain old hokey. Um, and did you know that those metal thunder sheets that used to create thunder gave us in English, in English a way to express the anxiety of being upstaged when somebody steals your thunder? Ah, yeah. Uh, so, of course, the 20th century, and uh, as we've seen in the last couple of days too, with audio techniques that can reinforce, change, echo the voice, with the possibility of separating sound from its source through recordings, with digitalization, which has made it possible to suppress live music while still creating orchestral effects. Um, all this has radically impacted sound on stage. Actors, for example, now miked, don't need to work their voices and their diaphragms in the same way. Even in the Festival d'Avignon, which I've been going to since 1970, uh, where actors manage to make themselves heard without mics in the cours d'honneur, it's no longer possible. Everybody is miked, um, which is interesting, right? Uh, so these days, contemporary soundscapes sometimes overtake the staging, and they certainly do far more than simply supplement other elements of theater in making meaning or creating sensation on stage. And there's a new category of theater professional called the sound designer, uh, who has since the 1980s joined the ranks of the set designer and the lighting designer as key contributor to the overall theatrical event. So with men, so many ways uh, to produce, reproduce, and spatialize sound, it is certainly not surprising that the theater has also invested in finding and making silence uh, as a contrast, as a statement, and as an emptying out. So uh, now, uh, we'll, we'll, I'm sure you have some questions about this, so hold on to them, and uh, we'll get to them after we listen to Roland Ozé, who's going to present his work uh, on thinking about sound, thinking about silence, and on his staging uh, um, of uh, in the solitude of the cotton fields. Rodon. Thank you, Judith. <coughs> um, nice. Um, I would like first to thank you, um, of course, Sarah Kay and Francois Nudelman for the invitation. 
and also Judith, of course, for the fabulous uh, translation of Cortes and all attention she has. So also thank you to uh, Jeanne Etelin and Thomas Murphy who helped me for this uh, presentation. Um, in fact, first I have a question for Francois and, and uh, Sarah about the title. The title is Sounds of Sound. It is like SOS. <laughs> what does it mean? Why are you called the Sound of Sound SOS? I think it's a very it's a strange, a strange point to begin to speak about sound, to send an SOS. So I was thinking, um, okay, this is, we have to think about something with uh, someone send uh, this, uh, this sound of uh, a question, let's mean. And uh, um, it's very interesting for me because uh, the thematic of today is staging, sound, and silence. And I would like to go in the other way, maybe to start from on the silence, to go to the sound, and after to go this, to the staging, and we can talk about Coltes. Um, I would like to, um, uh, to, um, to sort of definying my way of silence, a sort of like an attitude, then sound, and to move to the, to the staging of Coltes, uh, which we will play yesterday and play on Sunday too. Um, I remember a story to introduce the question of silence. When it was in 1990, I was in Darmstadt in the festival, contemporary festival of music. And I was uh, at the canteen, you know, the restaurant school, because the, the festival is in a school. And uh, I was eating my plate, and I was alone. And suddenly someone came in front of me eating. It was John Cage. So. I was l eating my plate and suddenly like that. And uh, <clears throat> of course, nothing for me to, uh, the, to give the possibility to speak. But at the five minutes after, he said to me, it's good. And uh, I said, yeah, it's good. <laughs> but, but I listened, it's God for me. I listened, it's God. Because it, it was God for me at this point. <laughs> so. It, it was it was credible. So after that, we spoke a little about not about music, but uh, we spoke about vegetables, mushroom, as you know. <laughs> uh, we spoke about uh, and suddenly we spoke about New York. I never been to New York at this point. I was so young, and and he, he said to me he was living near the Fifth Avenue, and he said to me about the sound, about the sound of the the city and the silence, or the no silence of the city. And it's, uh, I have this, this sort of conversation all the time in my mind when I work. And if we are recording the, this uh, John Cage piece called uh, 433, or perhaps if we consider silence like a sort of an audible cement of life, um, silence may be considered, to like John Cage said, like a sort of ready-made. Uh, it seems, I think, John Cage uh, is telling us. I believe that silence is a set of non-intentional art artistic possibilities. That is to say, artistic possibilities that are not voluntary and consciously regulated to achieve a finite goal. Uh, in this case, Silence is maybe the most interesting source to approach the word of sound. And I think this is very, um, a very good way that Cage gave to us. But I think, for me, that silence and sound are but one. It is just a matter of space. Space is what we create the necessary distance between silence and sound. And there is another philosophy, a philosopher called Merleau-Ponty that there is several, categor several categories of silence um, that could call the prosis of the world. And uh, there is dramatic silence, interrogative silence, pathetic silence, integrated silence, punctuated silence, resonating silence, introducing silence. There are so many differences, um, but... Um, I think the more incomprehensible one remains, 
without any doubt, the silence expressing an inability to communicate. Or, more precisely, the silence which tells us that artistic practice does not mean anything. Therefore, I would like to mention sound space as a variation of the question of the silence. First, in a performative approach of my, what we, we talk about that with uh, Judith about the theatrical space or dispositif théâtral in French. We don't know the, the right word. Theatrical space is okay. For my part, I explore this question as a sort of debated or negotiated environment between different media, text, sound, instrument. And I think today, theatrical space is made of different spaces, inner spaces, other spaces, interior spaces, exterior spaces, spaces facing, spaces facing another, assembling one with another, space in relation to all the places where the audience and the actor are located. For me, is, um, it's very, very, very important to have this consideration of uh, for a global form of the, the performance with the audience and the actors. So to the specific question about the relation between the sound and space, I would like to introduce now this, this idea, what we talk about a theatrical plan to conceive stage direction for theater. In this case, it, it's interesting to have a, an attention uh, to the attitude of sound. Um, one sound is built from the world around us, surrounding us. It's become the fuel of the relationship between the artistic element in the framework uh, of theater, what we call in French le cadre. It could even say that sound is like a sort of matrix for the other element, especially for me because um, I come from the music. My, my first job is to write music, but not in the way of to write scores, but to s think about music. And I, ca I can speak about uh, one of, one of important men for me was Yanis Xenakis at the end. At the theatrical plan, sound, a low writing which articulating, articulates meaning. Um, f thus, um, the plan is bound to the audio concept and expands to hurry the external element of the dramatic field of the play, but which are central. I am very attached by what we call in France dramaturgie sonore, uh, a sort of audio playwriting, which is the heart of represent represented story with the framework of sound plan. So, of course, in the Coltes project, I try to bend a th the theatrical plan toward, toward a territorial investigation public space representing the real stakes for turning the stage into a, an interactive space with the world. That's the project. In this way, I would like to uh, uh, now to introduce the attitude of staging, especially if, uh, on the Skull Test project. And to mention the notion of time in the theatrical plan I just presented. We move from the silence to sound and relation with space, but we should not forget about now time. In this piece, uh, The Solitude of Cotton Field by Marie Bernard Marie Coltes presents so many different temporalities because of many sort of urgency. A little like the Merleau-Ponty silence, but here it's an urgency like dramatic, interrogative, intimate, universal, political, etc. I like the idea to, to talk about urgency in theater, um, especially uh, in the time of the performance. Maybe it's sort of reminiscence of uh, one of my part of the, my work is called Agit Prop, Agitation et Propagande, I mean the theater now and here and now, with the project of uh, the solitude of Cotton Field. I created uh, a space 
for welcoming the Cortez world in the public space, as you saw, and the sound score, the music and the organization of sound, both playing in the same time of the performance. I have a feeling that with world, um, um, I have a, a sensation that time is only an instrument in the service of meaning, which is being projected outwards. Sound seems to follow the opposite way from the exterior to the interior of emotion and sensation. In the play of Cortez, sound and music play with continuity and discontinuity, with, it's, uh, with temporal alteration, with phenomena of waiting, delay, stretching, recall, anticipation, contradiction, anteriority, posteriority, simultaneity of, and memory, um, reminiscence, flashback, and so on. And I mean, all the element of what we can call composition uh, about the surprise, the speed, the rhythm, etc. In the other hand, the words of Cortes, they have their own mechanism, which call on memory, another crucial element for the smooth running of the performance, to find the question of meaning. And it's, it's so important for me. To, the words activate the spectator memory in order to fuel the poetic and the political aspect as well as the collective resonances. The word of Cortes, it's the composer speaking, is like a sort of harmonic materials, a block, and even a spectral. And this block is making sound. And for, in, for now, not sound, just sound. And after this sound, there is a sort of meaning coming from the words themselves, like a sort of steam of the shadow. In resume, in my job, in my work, music is a sort of more a sort, a sort of heart of space and the world, a sort of heart of telling. As I said, I remember in 1993, uh, I was assistant of uh, Yanis Xenakis. He's a French-Greek composer, uh, architect. And one day we were talking about opera. And, uh, and the relationships between the music, the words, singing voice, sound, and space. He told me about his uh, theater musical pieces. You know, maybe it's his Oresti, Mede, Deus Athena, with the presence of the anti-chorus and the choryphe. He told me that he could not find in the voice sung with words the force of tragedy. Tragedy for him was after the words. I was young, I said, what does it mean? Tragedy is after the words. And that he, he, he said to me that he need space and sound more raw. And uh, in this way, uh, when you know it's Munich, you understand what does it mean um, about this, this kind of raw material. So I can, sp I can speak a, a little about Bernard Marie Coltes' play. The first question is, uh, maybe Judith can ask me, why are you interested in this play? Yes, why are you interested in the Coltes play, Roland? Thank you, Judith. <laughs> this is a duet. <laughs> so um, if we are according to, the, to our theatrical legacy of Bernard Marie Coltes' view, uh, and especially the view of the world at this moment, the 80, and we, if we had to characterize the current state of things, we could say that maybe we are now a sort of out after the bacchanal, after a sort of orgy. That is to say, after the explosive moment of modernity and the revelation of so many artistic practices in all areas. So when you approach this text, what can we do? The play, what is the play about? This, so the play is, is the stage of a dealer and a client in a situation of negotiation. The dealers know that the client desires something and that the dealer can offer. However, the dealer is also dependent of the client desire, 
Okay, that's right. So now, what to do? Uh, what is very interesting is there is two presences, very different, where the crucial question of desire is at stake and is negotiating an economic exchange. It's a sort of dia dialogue between two loneliness locked, it up, locked up by the question and delaying an, an any exchange. What do you want from me? Asking the other by all means of speech to invite to respond to the fundamental luck to speak some or their through. Uh, each of them lives in a trap set by the other one in a never-ending affinity which must last until they run out of energy. Uh, there is a French philosopher called uh, Jean Baudrillard said, uh, everyone wants their other with the impetuous need to dominate the other, with the need to make them last in order to savor them. In Coltes, the opposite logic of the presumed I the likely meet in a dance of death. That is a pure, like we said, jouissance of the other ending. Because desire the other is always desire the end of the other, but the later, the better. The only question is to know who will hold up best, occupying space, speech, and the silence. One does not kill, one urges, but opponent to desire to accomplish their own symbolic death. For me, I, I think the, the word of Coltes is a perfectly working trap. Each of them hears clearly what the other is saying or wants to say, or if they doesn't answer, it's not because they don't, uh, they don't understand, but because they refuse to give them the present to, uh, of the intangibility of their thought or of their desire. About the music and the composition, I was very interested to developing a project around what we call in German, uh, it is a game for the, her for the hears. Uh, there is no, I think we use... I don't know. Is there a term, is there an equivalent term for this? Ostspieler? Ostspieler. Radio play? Radio, uh, radio, would you say radio play? Yeah. It is something like that. <laughs> Ostspieler. And, um, and the possibility of creating music that uh, will make its way through the intimacy of the gold test, gold test words, using the theoretical plan of headphones for the audience. I'm going to speak uh, of headphones uh, later. So we can speak about sound plan and the public space. The sound plan was born out of a reflection of the presence of the intimate in public space. That the point, the first point of my work. Cortes text shines with this rhetoric and traces the way of body and speech on the brink of social connection, desire, and one's relationship to the society. Its space can be, that's called, as said, an agora, a circle, a confrontation between the intimacy of the world and the public space. Welcoming in the intimacy, the project scenography is built around the unique space in bodying the accumulated desires of the dealer and the client. It is a theater which is all the same time, circular, bifrontal, urban, hidden, timeless, and suspended. There are all these axes different all the time. It's a question of staging the play with a scenography in which the confrontation between word and space create a blurry, sensual, and enriching distortion for the audience. The, what we call public space is characterized by a tension between safety and randomness, between a feeling of trust, security, non-aggression, risk, highly possible encounters, of course, good or bad, and whose outcome is uncertain. It's very interesting to know because um, the brother of Ber Bernard Marie Coltes told me that the idea of the solitude of Chant de Coton was born in New York. Coltes was in New York, he was on a, a riverside, and he was in a bar. The bar was called the Rabbit Cafe. The Rabbit Cafe? Yeah. The Rabbit. 
Peter Rabbit Cafe. Yeah. Thank you. And um, he saw two guys outside, and he said, I want to write the words of this intimacy I see now, just now. So um, it's interesting to play now in New York, because, um, of course, this story is nothing. We don't care about the story. But there is something strong about what I can call a feeling of uh, uh, this guy who brought these words here. It's not nothing. We can speak a little about headphones um, now. The relation to the audience is built through a strong element in the relationships to the actress and to the text. And the headphone is in the center of this articulation. So headphones are distributed to everyone in order to enter into the intimacy of the world and of the situation and of the actress body. I mean body because with the mic, we are so close to the voice, so close to the mood, so close to the body. And we can listen moving the body in the space. Also when they're never speaking, we feel something like that. And for me, it's very important. At a parallel to the poetic world, a sort of, I, I wrote a sort of cinematographic like music score unfolds. Um, headphones are today a sort of an instrument of intimate, which we own and which allows to make a way through our public universes. Everyone have headphones. And uh, for me, and for the stage, and for the piece, headphones is like a magnifying glass, like a loop. Or, and just a second after, you can use like a kaleidoscope. And you know, it's it's exactly when you're in a swimming pool. You're not all the time under the water. You're going under, and you're going up. You look, and okay, under, and up. And so the audiences have the same way. They can be very near the voices, and they can go like that, because the, the actors play more louder, and you so that gives the possibility to have to to write on self the 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 way of the the performance. Sometimes you did okay. I don't care about the headphones. My ears are so so hot. So and you listen to the you quite you listen a few words and it's okay and hop you come again. It's like a swimming pool, and I like this. Uh, not to say to the audience, okay, be careful, uh, we, you can't hear anything, so please put your headphone on your head, and, uh, please. So, okay, it's possible, but sometimes you can hear theater in the street, so it's possible to get out or not. And um, this is, for me, um, a sort of base of uh, how using the headphones. Of course, at the end, Headphones change our relationship to the silence, <coughs> to the sound world, and to the space since different sounds mappings can now exist. It changed to the relation that we have with the community of the theater, I mean the audience. Some people said, ah, oh, but we are not together. But we are together, but in a different, all moving all the time. I have many projects in the future uh, with this system, this configuration, and would like to continue my research because I know that this is the beginning of, uh, of my work and we have so many possibilities. I would like to write, I have a project of to take the, you know, uh, Patrice Chéreau did uh, a film, a movie called Hotel de France based on the Platonov of Chekhov. And I would like to, uh, I'm in time to write a sort of uh, theater opera with headphones. It is in a hotel outside, and the, and the audience are in the street. And there is some part of the pieces going in the room, outside, inside, moving, a car is coming, and so on and so on. And you can all the time do your swimming pool. And um, 
I have also different projects, and there is one, uh, I have a commission from the the National Theatre in Taipei to do the the same piece in Mandarin. So the problem is that I don't speak Mandarin. So uh, we have to find a way to work together. But they commissioned me that to use the possibility to use headphones with a smartphone. That means everyone is coming with this smartphone, they have an application, they connect it, and they plug the headphones, and they move in the street, and there is a geolocalization, and you can have a different sound, different uh, articulation, different space in relation with the, with the play. So, sounds is incredible. Um, and especially in June, there is a uh, last project I can tell you that uh, we are working with IRCAM for the next festival in June called Manifest. There is, we are working on a big platform. It's like a roof for the text called La Voix Humaine of Jean Cocteau uh, with a uh, uh, German artist, a writer, is Falk Richter. To, there is 200 people around the roof and uh, this is uh, like, La Voix Humaine is like your neighbor on the top and uh, the play is going. So there is different, uh, for me, it's a different way to find a relation between the, th- the sound and the theater. But hence, what is sure, it is that the, the sense of our sound world has been changed. Thank you. So uh, Roland has also brought some photographs of, yeah, uh, yeah of productions. Can, can you yes. show us some? Is, there t- is the technical person here who can run the... Do we have somebody here? Yeah, come yeah. here. So meanwhile, um, you said while you were speaking to us that you consider the work that you do agitprop. Do you mean this, that the Cotes piece is an agitprop piece? <laughs> I was sure she was sticking to it. <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is a trap. Well, so it's not a trap, but uh, you know, agit prop is, is is cartoonish. It's immediate. It's very highly political, yeah. and it's very specifically yeah. targeted. Absolutely. And um, but maybe, uh, but certainly, you must think of this Coltes play as political in some ways. Yes, the, you know, um, when you work on 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 the text, you, you this there is two elements. There is the text and you. There is a biography of the text, and there is a biography of you. So I feel a sort of relation between the, what can we say, politic way in, uh, in my, my practice of uh, later of uh, uh, this kind of theater. So uh, it's not a theory, theoric thinking. It's just uh, a way to find a vibration about the relation between the stage and the words. So it's not to, not political in the sense of political activism, but it's political no. in the sense of how you exist with your work. Absolutely, kind of okay. absolutely. So, so yeah. ma- maybe it's possible to switch off the light a little uh, and dancing. No, um, because it's. Uh, is it possible to start from the beginning again? What? What is it? The quick and short reading. Okay, which button? The left one. Okay. This is, ah, yes. Okay. Okay, the light off is coming. Coming. Is it okay for you? 
So this is different for photography. About um, the Solitude de Champs Coton, we play two years in tour in France in a several uh, different places. I mean, in a mall, in a stadium, in a parking, in a theater, in a street. Uh, anyway, different. So, um, and all the time we, um, we have a sort of uh, vibration very strong that's about the relation between the words, the piece, and the space, and the st what uh, we call about silence of the, this kind of ready-made, I told, uh, uh, of the cultes and the environment. So um, we can have a look on different uh, situations. This is very in interesting, because it is what I said, this different way of uh, this community of theater. It's completely, it seems to be completely exploded, but it's not. It is moving all the time. It is, you know, this is here, it's in a museum in Toulouse. There is people, they, are, they, they seem completely lost, but they are not lost, they are inside. The, the, two co the two actors is Anne Alvaro and the other is Audrey Bonnet, two very fantastic actors. You know, there is some people, it seems very, very you know, there is singularity. There is maybe sometime in front of, of 10, maybe 50 or maybe 100. And they have or not, ah, this is one, it, is, it was in the stadium of 20 mil plus. To the, Yes, and there was just a guy here. <laughs> but it's so strong, so the expression of the solitude, of course. When you're in a stadium alone, you're sol in solitude, of course. This, look. <laughs> and you can listen to the voice, as usually I said, I mean, very, very close to the hill. It's like a, a trip. This is a dealer, of course. This is in, in the street in the south of France. I like the people when where they are completely lost. Sometimes it was at night and sometimes in the day. It's very different. The words have a sort of different resonance if it is night or in day or in night. This is in a mall. Lift, of course. This is interesting because this person is completely inside. She's maybe she's outside the the piece, but not. She's inside, in fact. And this is very different because I, there is so many people like that. At what moment they are, they cut the eyes the, uh, and they are inside and listen to the words and the music. And uh, as I said, to the swimming pool, and they oh, and one time they coming out. This version is in, in the in Théâtre des Bouts du Nord in Paris. We are playing the first part outside the theater, in the street, beyond the metro, and coming inside the theater. I mean, it's like a deal. You see someone in the street, you communicate with him, and when you're connected, hop, you come into a little space to speak about. And the same in the museum. Voilà. So, so I, I will ask only a couple of questions because I'm sure you all have questions you want to ask as well. But I, since we've seen all of this uh, work in different spaces, and some of us, some of us saw things and uh, saw the show last night at the Kimmel Center and the staircase there, I would like to ask you really specifically about. Um, if you have spaces that you prefer 
and what the space that you used last night, what this space has meant, how you think that this has inflected the way that you're thinking about the work, okay? About yesterday, this is something wonderful, is um, this space is like uh, a passage. How do you say the passage? A passage, yes. Passages, yeah. And this is very, very important in the, in the play because they were talking a lot of uh, a passage, people, of passage but in inside. But in the play, though, it, one, it doesn't seem that there's anybody else there. So, uh, I mean, I thought that was really kind of an interesting uh, inflection of, of what was going on in, in the play itself, that suddenly there's a lot of people coming back and forth, and no one's paying attention to them except we are, of course. Mm -hmm. But Coltes is also uh, he's, he's thinking, uh, and I think in the text, there is uh, the question of the presence of the audience, because there is, you know, uh, Chero staging this piece in bifrontal situation. Uh, I think because Coltes st say that. And uh, of course, when you're sitting on the side, you see the actors and, and the audience. The others. Yeah. The others. So there is no passage, but there is other people in, this, in the game, in the, in the play, in the same time. So um, of course, this is very interesting. For me, it wasn't enough because uh, we used the headphones and I, I, I think it's very interesting to move uh, as I said. So um, it's what I said in my presentation that it's sometimes bifrontal. I think sometimes yesterday you, you are in sort of bifrontal situation. Yes, I mean, there and was a time when the audience was really a seated absolutely. audience. Absolutely. And the yeah. uh, just two seconds after, you're alone. You're also in a group, and sometimes you're outside. Yeah. You can, you, and this is, this is a sort of virtuosity of to change the space in the same play. And uh, for me, uh, the idea of the text inside about the situation to have characters after characters, different uh, evocation, that means we need, we need this different situa kind of situation, different kind of to uh, face to face with other people, different people. And I think if Coltes, if uh, Shero did the B frontal, it's typically for this reason that we need to see the guy the other people. and the others. And you see in Chuka, you have a panel of different people when you're sitting in a bifrontal. So uh, that's, I thought. But I, I mean, I also thought about that just in terms of how bearable it is to listen to all that text, because it's a lot of text. And I think it was Francois who said that some of your friends found it a little kind of everlasting, right? It went on and on. But, and yet, because there was so much stimulation from all of the people around that we weren't supposed to be looking at, but that we were looking at, because how could you not look at them, right, as they're going up and down the stairs? So it was another way of capturing attention. Mm. And I think that was pretty interesting. But, in, but I, I, you know, we, Hono and I have had this discussion about this play and also this discussion in general, because as I said earlier, I'm an image person and a body person. Um, and so putting the headphones on makes me nervous because I'm not so sure, it might bring me in the play, but I'm not sure that it be brings me in to community. Uh, and I'm also not sure what happens to the actors when this happens. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'd, I'd kind of like to ask Roland how, how difficult it has been to work with actors with this, and especially the American actors. Mm -hmm. I have no idea, strong idea before coming. And uh, I would like to be shocked by the language. And we start the work, and I feel that uh, there is something really, like I said, like um, uh, harmonic materials. Of course, I'm not, I'm French, so I can understand the text, of course, but uh, I listen like a, also like a composer. I, I listen this text like a, a block, like an organic harmonic system, like, uh, and, uh, I, I try to work with the, the actress to, and I ask them not to stop on the f sentence, on the words, to go like if you conduct a Ferrari and, you, and, and uh, if you go with a car fast and you, you walk and you round on the, with the water on the, on the street, there is a water is coming from the floor. And, um, uh, we tried, I tried to build this relation between what I call the block of the text and the sort of steam about the shadow, what's coming up. 
And for me, uh, also, but also in French, but I think more in English, uh, the sensation of uh, to this shadow coming up the block of the text is very strong. And um, also, this is for me like to listen to the music of the, the languages. And um, so it, it was very interesting to work on this direction. So, but the reality is we have not so many time to work. We have just a week. Uh, so we have to run very fast. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there are three of us, I think, in the room who saw it in French last year. And uh, then we've seen it in English this year. And we saw, we saw it with the French actors that you showed us, with Audrey and with um, Anne. Anne. And then uh, this year with, uh, with Oceana and uh, Tori, and who are American trained actors. But I, uh, I have to say, and I don't know whether it's because it was my translation <laughs> and in English, or whether it was because it's my institution of theater, it's my conventions of theater, right? But they, these two American actors really gave the text a lot of life. Mm. They dug into it mm. in a kind of psychological way that I didn't think the French actors did. And I just think that has something to do with the different ways in which we do theater, because the French actors could speak that beautiful text of, of Cortes, and they didn't have to in, embody it. But the American actors really seemed to need to embody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think uh, I feel that the status of the language is not the same in English and in French yeah. for the actors. Yeah. Uh, they have a sort of uh, a relation with the words, a different relation with the words. For the English version, they like that into the words and they inside directly. For the French, there is so many references to 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 be on stage with words. Of course, this is different culture. And um, uh, the way it's, m it's a long way, it's like pomade. <laughs> C uh, cream or cream. lotion. Yeah. yeah. You, uh, when you work with the French artists, you have to stroke them. Yeah. And a long time. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> but it's so interesting, very interesting, because, uh, and here we have, we have in fact, just uh, five days. And we have to go directly. And I said to uh, Oceana and Tori, OK, we are together. So uh, we have no choice. We are going, uh, like I said, to the swimming pool. OK, directly, put your maillot, we go inside. And we were together in like a, like a sort of warrior of the text. And uh, it was very, very interesting that because they came in this play and in this game on this way very, very quickly. And it was a very, very pleasure for me. So I have, I, before I turn the questions over to the audience, I have one more question, which is th those of us who were there last night heard that there, at moments there are sounds, at moments there are pings, at moments there are very loud sounds. That, so I want to ask you if this, what, what you said this wonderful thing about urgency, t temporal urgencies. Yeah. And is it that sense of temporal urgency uh, that allows you to know when you want to put sound there, or it, or and how do you how do you decide when it's only voices or when you have sound and voices at the same time and what where you put the, where you put the, the the is that your interpretation of what the text means? How S how do you get to this? Yes, there is some of part of interpretation of the sense of the text, of course. But there is also, uh, as I said, uh, sort of uh, sensation, emotion. That sometimes I feel that we need music or we need words for the relation of with the time. We, you know, uh, compositionally, of course, we have to uh, to put some sort of mathematic elements uh, side by side, after, after, and so on. But at the end, uh, uh, this is the here's the side all the time. It was Xenaki said that. I asked one day, I said, okay, you are using uh, mathematics uh, for music and, uh, and you put the result uh, with the, the act of composition. And, uh, and I said to him, and after, who decide if you have to cut this, this, or this? And he said to me, it's my hearers decide at the end. So this is the same. I, th I think I can have a sort of analysis of the text 
and all of the relation between an instrument. I mean, for example, there is a lot of different way of the, the relation of the electronic and the piano and the string. So this is a concept conceptual composition. So do, d but do you, did you end up changing it at all during rehearsal or, n or never? Once it's yes. You mean in here? No, I hear no. you didn't. I know you didn't have time yeah. to. No, no, no. But otherwise. Time. Yes, you, of course. Of yeah. course. There is a, there is a, a project it's a, it's at the beginning. It's developmental Yes, then. absolutely. Yeah. And in the time, uh, in the space where we change different, uh, make longer cut and so on, we use the, the hearse of composer. Yeah. And this is, I think maybe this is important to be an artist, not to be just. Uh yeah. So I think we should ask some questions now. Bunwa, come. Uh, um, yeah. A question Th Th uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas, you have the mic. You have the mic. The two of you. Thanks. Okay. Hi, my question is for Roland. It's <sighs> kind of a follow-up to Judy's question about how you s scored this um, music. Um, and, and I was speaking to the actors last night, and I was surprised when they told me, we can't hear the music at all. Yes. Um, so if we think about this composition having three musical parts, the part that we hear that's created by the, the atmosphere that we're in, that's left up to chance, mm -hmm. the text, and then what you've written, um, how, how do you see the text and what you've written being composed as a duet? And how do you time this? Or is it left up to chance? Um, okay, I can answer the question of why the actress they doesn't listen to the music. This is exactly when you speak about opera. When you work music in your opera, dans la fosse, downstairs, you never listen to the singer or the, you, you listen, you just watch the chief. And uh, I think there is something very strong in a, a sort of mechanism when you play words, music staging and so on that if everybody listen or watch all the elements of the all the elements i think it's like a bordel <laughs> i mean this is because it's sort of a score you know when you are in a orchestra you play the violin you play the violin you don't listen to the part of the flute or yes there is a chief who is conducting and looking at all the different parts but i think we for the reason we have no time, the, the, the actress have the text moving in the space. Be careful to the people. Be careful to the space. And if you put the music inside, I think they are crazy about five minutes. So uh, it's two, two reasons. One reason is what I said about uh, each person at the right place. And the second reason is to protect and there is another reason is sometimes but actors that when the music is go slow they are going slow mm. or sometimes the music is going fast they are going fast so i hate this relation of uh, the relation with the music and the words so i said okay do your job i do mine yeah but this meant you really had to know your partition well because you could have really goofed it up if you had them go slow at parts where you needed them to go fast because of where the sound and music was. Yeah. 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 But that also means you're using the actors like instruments, but you know, that's <laughs> <laughs> that's part of our Yes, because there was a moment where like they would reach the climax of a sentence and it would stop right as your music stopped. And I thought, yeah. that's a beautiful choreography, and yet what you're saying is that's not necessarily how it might be every time. No. Yes. Uh, merci, uh, c'était vraiment tout à fait passionnant. Et uh, ma question, c'est vraiment au autour du silence, around silence, because um, in a sense, uh, with the play yesterday, we, we moved back into the circulation uh, that Benoit told us we moved out of. But what we moved out of with the circulation was also we moved out of communication that was verbal, that had the audience part of the soundscape, if you want, of the theatre. And uh, what I found quite striking about the event yesterday was who made sound. Uh, we had the sonic experience of the, um, the score. We had the actors speaking. 
uh, we had all these students and, and other people walking around and their cell phones going, etc. But we as an audience behaved like any other audience. We were listening to something that was well performed to pick up on, on, on those 17th century writers. So if it is performed well, we listen, we sort of completely sort of take our subjectivity out of it. And in a sense, while there's an anarchy in terms of movement that the, the, um, the piece allows, it does not allow us to revert to participating speakers. We are, in effect, meant to be quiet and listen. And I thought that's a really interesting way in which some things are still part of the old theatre tradition, even though we are moving. So I think the sound is the is is, is f almost more interesting to me as a kind of shift, and the silence. Who is silent? Who speaks? Who who makes noise? Uh, in the seventeenth century, and in the twenty first century. Tu veux répondre ça? Tu peux le dire? C'est plutôt pour toi. C'est plutôt pour moi. I, I don't understand the question, in fact. But it's no, c est, c est uh, c'est vraiment une question uh, dans, dans le sens que on va rester quand même dans l'attitude de l'écoute. Oui, je comprends. Et, uh, et, et, et de l'entente par l'écoute, mais pas dans la par participation autre que en fait par mouvement par euh, faire attention à ce qui est le son. C'est-à-dire on est dans, dans une sorte de réception du son, mais pas dans une partition, participation du, du sonore. Ce qui produit le son, ce n'est pas l'audience. Ce qui est la grande différence euh, de, de ce qu'on venait, justement, euh, avant qu'on était devenu discipliné. Et ce qui... Je, je me demande et, pourquoi... Je comprends. Mm, je Yes, of course. Uh, the, the first point is this piece, Bernard de Récoltes, The Solitude de Champ de Coton. So this is the poussière, as you said. So we, I have to mettre en scène la poussière. This is exactly as I said. So, um, and uh, of course, my way in my job in this project is to find a way to mettre en scène la poussière. I mean, it's to, uh, to try to put a sort of... Uh, uh, in sort of an installation to put these words uh, in a setup and to reorganize the relation between the words and the audience. So uh, this is very, very clear. And there is no possibility, I think, in my way, no possibility to, uh, to explode the text, to uh, move the, to go inside the sound of the audience and to integrate in sound. This is not my way. Uh, but I'm, I understand what you said. Uh, that's, this is my hand of the presentation. This is uh, in the future that gave me the idea and the necessity not to put mettre en scène la poussière, but to write a new concept for this installation and to, uh, to explode the narration. And that's the reason why my, my first project in the future with it, it's, it's to work about Platonov, of uh, Chekhov, because, because, because this piece is completely explode. This is the change time, that change of uh, uh, way of different characters, that, that change of all the time of time, that change of place, and so on and so on. And you, you are not it's not necessary to play like a, a chronologic way, but you can play this, m make a reverse, make an, an acceleration, and so on and so on. I agree with you that we need a new dramaturgy now for this kind of dispositive installation. And this is not the project of Coltes. The project is what you saw yesterday, or what you will see on, on Sunday, is to mettre en scène la poussière. This is not a very old poussière, but it's poussière quand même. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have a question for uh, <coughs> Roland Zé and a sort of feedback uh, after the experience of yesterday. Um, I think what was amazing, uh, probably in every performance, it's 
for me, it's not more about silence, more about to be interrupted by people coming or to interrupt them by, by hearing in front of them. This, the situation is rather strange. But then I have, uh, I have a question, because in a way, there is this specialization of things, but in headphone, there is absolutely no specialization. It means if it you have the voice without the effect of the whole. When you norm normally listen to anything, you have the source and the space. It's not the source in itself. And in that way, it's cut. Uh, so can you, maybe could you imagine in, in other option, other performance to, to, to add sort of space, but in the headphone? And in a way, I did it myself by <laughs> sometimes taking out, taking off the headphone or, to, or keeping just one. And then it was really uh, amazing also to have space plus this mm. intimate relation. Mm. Thank you. This is what I said about swimming pool. Um, I was saying about uh, put it on the mayo and going to the piscine in swimming pool and going down up and so on. But about the relation between the specialization about the voice or not and the music, uh, I decide to, uh, to, to have a strong direction to use specialization for, for music because, as I said in my presentation, I think the music is like to uh, a space, the heart of space. And so we can, I can build a sort of uh, 3D space into this 3D space of the stairs of the chemo and to keep the voice like a sort of uh, theater, like they're telling the, the sense and, and to separate, separate with a very strong point of view, the space for the music and just the sense for the text. And uh, of course, of course, uh, it, it is the same way in what you ask about the dramaturgy, uh, special dramaturgy. So there is so many things to do with that. Uh, but my way is to uh, it is not to lose the audience with the text. Uh, as I said also, the text is like a block. And you need to, for me, uh, you need to receive the block in front of you. And without other space, because we need the, the words immediately come into your face and to put it on your body. So in this way, you have a chance not to be loose inside the different way to go inside. You know, a cortex is like a grand huit. I don't know if you, you know this. Uh, an, inf an, in an infinite eight, yeah. Yeah, empty eight. It is the cortex all the time. So you're going up, whoop. So this is the reason why I, I chose to separate the, the, space, the space for the heart, music, and the sounds, sense for the words. But I understand. But, what it, what, what, and, but I think what you're also saying and what is really interesting with this kind of a, an, a, 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 a production is that every spectator can see it differently, can hear it differently, can receive it differently, depending on what they do with their headphones, depending on whether they get up or sit down, depending on whether they, s all of that. So it's, it's, it is, uh, there is a kind of, part in other words, to get back to what you said, Anagra, there is a kind of participation. It's not, sp it's, they're not speaking necessarily, and they're, n they're not necessarily making a difference in what happens with the two actors, but they're making a difference in terms of what happens to them and what happens to the rest of the audience because they're not sitting, and we did sit quite a lot more last night than one necessarily would have had to. Yeah. How often did people speak around uh, the actors when you did it in the mall a few years ago? Yes, some, so yes. Did it change um, the, the piece? dynamic? No, they changed the dynamic, of course. Some people, for example, yesterday, there was one guy asked, something to uh, Oceana. Yeah, outside. Okay. Yeah, outside. Yeah, he grabbed her. I uh, think she even. asked, uh, maybe he asked direction or something like that. And we, uh, we remember the also so many different places. Uh, the people ask, uh, where is the cinema? Where is, my re where is the restaurant? Or when we were in the mall, please, where are the lift? And so on. So uh, the actors have to stay without connection mm -hmm. 
they stay in the text. And the people stay like that, and, and s step by step, they move. This is very interesting, but it's, uh, this is like a sort of two spaces, two times, two different times. You know, this is like in, uh, in, um, in films, a movie like that, so, uh, where you have two sort of times. There is a time of the, the life, and there is another time, as I said, uh, inner spaces, outer spaces. And there is another time, another space in the space. And we, you have to keep, as I said, with the voice and the music, you have to keep really strongly to separate the two elements. If, for me, I, I decide uh, it's not dogmatic position. This is my way. Okay, I think it's one minute to four o'clock, so perhaps it's time for us to break up, unless there's one more question that somebody wants to ask. So we're, we have a half an hour break. And we should be back here at 4.30 to listen to Jonathan Goldman, who's going to be talking to us about Boulez, which is great.